next up, we have Nathan Wilcox, and he's from Least Authority, and he'll be talking about uh, private transactions on a public blockchain, aka zero cash. Right. So, um, I like how Devin kind of um, mentioned his, his experience with the big picture and why he feels like decentralization is important. Um, and I hope I can tie my talk into that uh, near the end. Um, yes, so I'm going to talk about zero cash. Who has heard of zero cash? Okay. Um, what about zero coin? All right. Um, those are slightly distinct things, but they're made by the same people. Zero cash is the newer, cooler version. So, um, who we are. So I work with Least Authority. Um, we're engineers. We focus on security. Um, we, uh, yeah, we, so we're most well known for working on something called Tahoe Laughs, which is a distributed um, secure storage system. Um, and we also do security audits on a bunch of open source, privacy preserving, freedom loving projects. Uh, and we're collaborating with some other folks, including uh, the cryptographers uh, behind ZeroCoin, LibSnark, and ZeroCash. And um, I'll get to LibSnark in a moment. That's sort of the, the delicious heart of ZeroCash. Um, and we're also going to collaborate with some other cryptocurrency experts who have worked on things like uh, Permacoin, Foxcoin, um, non-outsourceable proof of work, uh, in the past, we worked on something called Mojo Nation, which is sort of a predecessor to a lot of these new um, uh, storage networks with payment schemes built in. Um, a long time ago, Zuko, who's the CEO of Least Authority, worked at uh, DigiCash. So that was the 90s, and that was like one of the first attempts to make a uh, purely digital currency. So what are we going to do? We're going to uh, develop the zero cash protocol into a working system. So zero cash is a cryptographic protocol. It's not a coin or a chain yet. Um, and we're working with the, the cryptographers behind it to, to make that happen. So um, it's going to be a Bitcoin-like system that, that we're prototyping. Um, but I wanted to point out that the protocol itself uh, can be applied to any ledger. So it's not specific to Bitcoin. It could be used on a centralized system, for example. Um, so I was just going to give you an overview of how the protocol works at a pretty high level and then talk about what that might mean for the ecosystem and individual empowerment and decentralization. Um, so there are two operations that Zero Cash uh, relies on. One is called protect, or I'm going to call it protect, um, and the other is called pour. So the idea behind protect is pretty simple. In a Bitcoin-like world, it's where you post a transaction to the blockchain, and that's just going to um, take your unspent UTXOs, so the value you uh, hold in a Bitcoin address, and put it into a confidential bucket. Um, oh, a quick thing, if you read papers on zero cash, I'm using slightly different terminology because I find it less confusing. So uh, the papers say you mint a coin, but I say you uh, protect a bucket. And the reason is um, the bucket contain an arb can contain an arbitrary amount of value. Um, I think this is from the earlier work on zero coin where each coin just had a fixed uh, denomination, and that's not the case in zero cash. So um, once you have buckets that are confidential, what can you do with them? Uh, you can pour them into new buckets, and that's basically it. Um, so the, the, the basic kind of pour would have two inputs and two outputs, and that lets you do things like combine your buckets, it lets you split buckets, um, and anyone can be the owner of the output bucket. So I can split my own buckets if I want to, or I can split a large bucket and uh, give you part of the value in your own bucket. Um, and there's a constraint that the total amount of value in the incoming buckets is the same as the outgoing buckets. 
which um, it's hopefully obvious, but it's important to make sure that that's the case. Um, and whoever creates the poor transaction has to own the input buckets. These are two good rules for a currency. Uh, anyone can own the output buckets like I just described. Okay, so how is this better than Bitcoin, for example? Because it actually sounds very much like Bitcoin, right? Um, a Bitcoin transaction takes multiple TX ins and sends them to multiple TX outs. Um, so the difference is that only the owners of the buckets know who, uh, who, like which buckets are involved and how much value is in those buckets. Uh, but the miners still know that the value going in and coming out is equal. So that's the weird magic of zero cash. So how is this possible? Um, the answer is with a ZK snark, of course. <laughs> the what? <laughs> yeah, so ZK snark is the uh, cryptographer's term for the, the engine at the heart of the poor trick. So this stands for zero knowledge, succinct, non-interactive argument of knowledge. See if you can say that over and over. <laughs> and over. Um, no thanks. <laughs> so uh, so I'll, I'll break down each of those, I'll, I'll break down the phrase um, so that it makes sense. Um, the argument of knowledge is the two um, constraints that you want to have on the core that the miners are going to verify. Um, so that the input value and output value are equal. So the currency is, um, is you know, constrained to follow that rule. And also that the input buckets are uh, own, you know, controlled by the person who made the poor. That's what the argument of knowledge is. There's a little terminology thing. Argument is the cryptographer way to say proof. Um, we're proving to the miners. Uh, technically, an argument, uh, if there were a very, very powerful computer, they could trick miners. Um, or there's another condition where miners can be tricked, which I'll get to you <coughs> later, or maybe in the question section. Um, zero knowledge is the other super important bit. So the miners don't know um, which buckets are the output buckets, and they don't know how much value is in the buckets. Um, Non-interactive is also important. There's a way to you know, do zero knowledge uh, proofs that's interactive, where whoever was creating the poor in this case would have to talk to the miners in an interactive protocol and convince them. We don't want that, because we just want to put the poor on a blockchain, and a year later, somebody can come by and verify that and believe in that blockchain. Um, and then succinct seems like a simple thing, but the transactions fit on the blockchain, and the cryptographers have worked very hard to make this possible. Okay, so now we almost have a decentralized currency, but we want to prevent double spins. This part is actually really easy and doesn't involve any crazy crypto goo. Um, each bucket just has a unique identifier, and once it's spent, that's published. So the poor uh, operation includes the ZK snark magic stuff, but it also just reveals which two buckets are being spent. Um, right, so if the miner ever sees the same identifier twice, they know that the second one is a double spend. Um, and it's subtle but important to note that the identifiers or the serial numbers for buckets are only revealed in that case. And that way, nobody observing the blockchain can you know, uh, make a correlation between two, the, you know, the same serial number appearing in different situations. So, okay, so that's it. Those are the operations. Um, but now to, uh, to talk a little bit about why this is awesome for users and the, the industry. Um, when people talk about privacy and security, uh, what, what do people usually think about? I think 
many people often think about advanced uh, tools or complicated protocols or something that they don't necessarily need. They don't need privacy if it's going to be this extra complicated stuff. Um, but I'm going to argue that if we can do zero cache right, it will actually be easier for users to think about and use. Um, it'll be simpler for, uh, for industry to adopt and to create infrastructure around. And it will be safer for people to use and for the industry. Um, and it'll be safer for commerce. Okay, so it's easier because um, users can just believe one address is one identity, which is perhaps intuitive. But that's not the case with Bitcoin. Um, and that's led to uh, you know, a lot of complications. So uh, just to go back. So with zero cash, you might um, you know, put an address on a billboard for your business. And now you don't have to worry about what privacy implications that has for your customers or yourself. So it's nice that you don't have to worry about that. It's just easy to do it. Um, so it's simpler for infrastructure because uh, you don't have to keep track of many addresses or their relationships or um, do things like BIP32. So you know, if you're doing BIP32 to deterministically generate keys, how do you know which of those addresses have actually been received by your users, which of those uh, addresses have been used? Um, do you scan the blockchain? Do you record it in your local MySQL database? What if you lose that database? Um, uh, also, if you are creating many addresses because you want some kind of privacy guarantees uh, that Bitcoin doesn't have natively, um, you need to keep track of their relationships locally. And I, like, sometimes I wonder if the, some of the auditing difficulty with Mt. Gox might come from the fact that they don't remember which addresses were used for what purpose or what their relationship is. But that's totally speculative. Um, so uh, zero cash is safer also because uh, you don't want the world seeing all of your transactions necessarily. <clears throat> With zero cash, you have that option and you can do that if you would like, but you don't have to if you don't like. Um, and you can also selectively reveal um, your transaction history to only particular auditors, for example. Um, so that might be good for, for regulation or um, for auditing. Um, it may be the case that uh, having confidentiality is required by law. So I'm not a lawyer, and I don't know if this is true or not, but it, it may be the case that if you're dealing with medical if you're in the medical industry and you're accepting payments from users, you need to protect their financial privacy. Um, so you want to make sure you can do that. So you want uh, confidential transactions. Okay, so um, here's a chart where, can everyone see that? It might be kind of small. Uh, the bottom has corruption resistance going to the uh, right. <clears throat> so as we move right, the system is harder to corrupt. Um, the vertical axis has confidentiality. So if we imagine a centralized ledger or a bank, um, it's the one on the left here. It's actually a bit more confidential than Bitcoin because um, you know I can't see your bank's records. They can see it, and whoever they share it with can see it. So it's not completely <coughs> confidential, but it's uh, perhaps better than Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is amazing and is an innovation because it was able to decentralize tracking of the ledger. So now we don't have to rely on a single authority to verify that the rules are being followed. We all know the rules, and everyone's working together to verify them. Um, so that's a lot harder to corrupt, and that's why decentralization can be valuable. Um, but it's come at a cost, uh, which is that it has low confidentiality because everyone is revealing the entire graph of their relationships economically and 
uh, the values flowing through that graph. And that's a lot of information. Um, metadata is a lot of information. So zero cache is stepping up um, so that we have both confidentiality and corruption resistance. So we can have a system that's uh, decentralized. Everyone can contribute to verifying that the rules are followed, but the users also have confidentiality. Um, so that's actually kind of the amazing thing about, uh, so zero cache is like the first example of doing this, right? So it's, uh, it's good for transactions, but what else can we do with this zero knowledge proof stuff? Now we can come up with arbitrary rule sets, maybe, um, and make systems where whoever is verifying that those rules are being followed doesn't have um, vision into the user's data directly. So users can have confidentiality, auditors can verify that rules are being followed, and the auditors could be everyone, the general public. So, you know, this can be applied to smart contracts, hopefully. There's still a lot of like research and engineering to do here, um, but maybe this could apply to voting systems, to all kinds of um, rule verification. Greg's my plant, by the way, because I, I didn't have a slide. Could you elaborate a bit on the trusted setup that's involved with uh, zero cash? Yeah. And some of the how that works, some of the potential problems that can can come up with it and the mitigation. Sure. So that, that was our clients of question. But this is a really important point, and I didn't have a slide for it, and he asked me immediately, and I was like, oh yeah, I definitely should talk about that. So, um, this is amazing technology, DK Snark, uh, but it has trade-offs. So one of the trade-offs is that it um, relies on a set of parameters. So each thing you want to prove, each like logical assertion, needs its own set of parameters. Um, to generate these parameters, you need a secret, and from the secret you derive um, public data. And the public data is the parameters. Um, if anyone knows the secret, they can fool any verifier into believing um, statements which are false. So that's terrible, right? So the only way it works is if no one knows the secret. So that's been the main hurdle for making zero cash something real. Um, so what the cryptography team has been working on is a, um, oh, I wanted to point out one subtle thing about the failure case here. If in zero cash this happens and somebody knows a backdoor, um, then what they're able to do is counterfeit because they, um, can lie about the statement that says the value in is equal to the value out. So they can create value or destroy value. So that's uh, catastrophic. But they don't compromise confidentiality. Um, so that might be important. Um, so the cryptographers are working to uh, create a protocol to create public parameters that involves multiple parties. And the, um, the features of the protocol are that if any one participant succeeds at participating um, and not leaking the secret out of their device and destroying the secret successfully, then the parameters are secure. So if any one person, if any one participant can do that, um, then it will be a success. Um, so that's kind of a basic construction that we're developing now to make practical. Uh, and we're exploring future ideas like, can we um, have multiple rituals with increasingly large supersets of participants? So, you know, like each month there's a new ritual on the blockchain. Um, so eventually there's thousands of people participating and if any one of them does the right thing, then the whole system is secure. Um, 
but there's a lot of practical trade-offs in that. So that's sort of where we are, we are at with the parameter setup. Okay. Other questions? So you said that in a zero cash transaction, the value of the inputs is equal to the value of outputs. Mm -hmm. On the Bitcoin blockchain, that's almost never the case. It's very difficult to do the zero fee transaction. In. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess zero cash can be used on top of a blockchain. Mm -hmm. So how, do, how does that work out? Yeah, actually, so I kind of glossed over, but the actual core has bucket inputs and bucket outputs, and it also has standard UTXOs. So um, this, all of the outgoing value sums to the input value, but some of it is uh, what we call public, and some is confidential. Public is just like Bitcoin value. Um, we haven't decided that yet. There's a prototype that's just a fork of Bitcoin that's just using SHA-256. Um, I think we're probably, I, we're considering proof of work, different proof of work functions. Um, but, I mean, there's, yeah, that's sort of where we're at. In the back? Uh, if I don't receive a, a, a fork, Um, I don't actually know the answer to that. I think you only know the value that's in your bucket. And do I have to look at every um, core on the, on the blockchain to find the ones that are mine? Or do I have to have a person do the core tell me in advance to look for one? Um, you can do it either way. So the prototype that we have, um, the sender uh, includes in the... so. The pour includes uh, arbitrary memo for the transaction that the sender can send to the recipient. Um, the recipient can scan the whole blockchain and attempt to decrypt all of the pours. Um, it's using an encryption scheme that um, does not reveal to the public uh, which public key has been encrypted to, which gives you the gives you um, anonymity of the graph, um, or, you know, so that's the fallback, or there could be a protocol where the sender contacts the recipient, but then you need to also think about um, anonymity or confidentiality. And so sort of following that, would that be a way to, to pay the miners as well, for the poor to them? Or yeah, to uh, the I, I might need to think about that more. I don't, I, I, I actually am not too sure that's possible because, um, the miners are all competing. You don't know who will win a block. Um, if maybe if we had something like an opcode that says, "Insert the current Coinbase, O miner, whoever you are, uh, and we'll pay you," maybe you could do something like that. But um, it's hard to do in Bitcoin. Do you have a limit on the memo field? Um, Yes, but I don't know what it is. It's kind of, I mean, right now, a lot of those parameters are kind of arbitrary for mm -hmm. us. Um, so, we're yeah. thinking about it. Oh, but I wanted, so, I assume you're interested in building applications on top? Mm -hmm. um, it's not, I assume, uh, uh, plain text? No, it's not plain text. Okay. So, um, if we made it large enough and it were easy to embed things for an application, mm -hmm. it would be kind of nice because the application would have some confidentiality guarantees without needing to worry mm -hmm. exactly how that works. Yeah. Uh, perhaps there's people in this room that have a threat model that dictates they use Tor mm -hmm. all the time or some of the time. And for people like that, I just wanted to make sure that uh, you might mention any or integration that the zero cash team is planning. Yep. Uh, I had any sort of like communication with the Tor project. Okay, so David is my coworker. He's the other plant. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you need so the the transaction protocol has all this great confidentiality, but if everyone like if we all have magical envelopes that are sending money between each other and it's confidential, but we all walk up here and post it on the board in front of everyone, it doesn't really help. So you need, um, you need messaging uh, confidentiality. So uh, we'll, we'll probably have some kind of Tor integration 
Um, and we'll be, we, we also need to be careful about that because you don't want to put an entire blockchain on the Tor network. Um, it might stress it too much and we don't actually need that for the properties we want. You only need to send the fours over Tor. More questions? So I suppose there was a, um, about your Bitcoin wallet, you can create coins out of thin air. It could be very noticeable, you can see it happen. Yeah. If it's similar about your version for zero cash, should there be a way to detect that? Um, not as it exists now. Um, so that's a concern. Um, there are ways, it, there's kind of a trade-off because um, if, so if the total amount of um, zero cash that's confidential is known, like if that's a public global value that everyone knows, uh, then you still can't tell if someone's creating some just for these few transactions here, unless you're doing a, a checkpoint uh, across the whole blockchain, right? So. Um, if you know the total, for example, if you know the total is a thousand or less, somebody can counterfeit up to a thousand. So if you start turning that knob and you you have finer and finer grain detection mechanisms, those start to erode the confidentiality. So there's kind of a fundamental tension, um, as far as I know, there. So that makes the parameter setup even more um, important to do right.